welcome you on behalf of First Christian Church for this Turner Lecture. It was 23 years ago, I'm told, that under the leadership of David Edwards, of Pete Moore, and of Gene Franks, that I know for sure, and the blessing of Dean Turner that this lecture began. We're blessed to be beneficiaries of Dr. Turner's ideals as we come together this afternoon to hear Reverend Dr. Joan Brown Campbell. We continue to honor the ideals of a faith that seeks understanding. And we thank also Dr. Turner's family who is here today, Nancy and Jimmy. We are blessed to have you be part of this family. But we also say thanks to another who is not here with us physically today. It's hard for most of us to imagine this Turner Lecture and the planning that went into it without thinking about Pete Warren. Like much of his ministry, his passion drove all of us to dream big and to work hard to make it happen, and that is another reason that we are here today. He is another giant with, on whom we stand this afternoon and that we miss sorely. I know that we are in for a treat today, and we welcome all of you your presence with us. Thank you. Good afternoon to have as our speaker, the Reverend Dr. Joan Brown Campbell. Dr. Campbell was the first ordained woman to serve as the General Secretary of the National Council of Churches in the USA, and prior to that as Director of the United States Office of the World Council of Churches. She is presently Director of Religion at Chautauqua Institute, and I saw from the Chautauqua calendar, which I received this last week, that she's going to have a celebration there of her minister in August. And she told us at lunch that it was going to be a roast. <laughs> Dr. Campbell has, has worked side by side with many well-known leaders in our nation and was the only woman marching in the clergy procession for the installation of Desmond Tutu as Archbishop of South Africa. She is a world traveler, an activist, and very outstanding leader, as you can see from her biographical information. And I love it that the last sentence tells us that she has three grown children and is grandmother to eight. Although she is a busy woman, she is also a family person, and I imagine that is one of her proudest accomplishments. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Campbell as our 2013 Turner Lecturer. my thanks to the Turner family for the inspiration that was given through others that this your father should be recognized for all that he thought and believed. And for Pete, it's hard to believe that he's not here, although I do believe he is. Um, he's kind of watching over us, I do believe, because I had many conversations with him and we talked together about what should the topics be, and what should we say, and what would be helpful for people to hear. And so I'll have to wait for see how the answer comes to me as to whether I met his, uh, his desires for that. So it's a pleasure to be here today. I do want to say also to Lynchburg College, who gave me an honorary degree that about some 25 years ago. And it's what's important is they gave me an honorary degree before I was head of the National Council of Churches and before all of those things happened in my life. And so it's one of the very first ones that I received, and so I'm especially grateful to their recognition of my ministry that early in time. And so it's a special, a special treat to be back here. The topic that I chose for today was called Living the Ecumenical Life of Faith. This is the title that we've given to the Turner Lecture. I pray that I have to say that I think one of the reasons I chose it was if I would be around, which I will not be, to say what will be the final words on my tombstone, I think what I would like it to say, for anybody who's around and anybody that asks you, <laughs> she lived the ecumenical life of faith. Having laid claim to the title, let me try to express what I think would describe the ecumenical life of faith. Many of you know my history. From 1979 to 2000, 
I serve the National Council of the Churches of Christ in the United States and the World Council of Churches. There are no two organizations any more difficult to serve than those. <laughs> they were both gift and challenge. They were rich and full years. They were life-changing years. The global encounter of those years were tumultuous. If you think back, these were the times of the end of the Vietnam War, the coming to prominence of Martin Luther King, the election of the first African-American mayor in Cleveland, and then the, the deaths that came to president and president people wanting to be president to a whole list of people. And this year is an incredible year because this is the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And it is also the 50th anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech. And a lot of things seem to have come together. But it was an amazing place to be during those years in which so much was happening. The church was alive and vibrant and changing. There was lots of difficulties within congregations at times, but there was also a vibrancy and a touching what was happening in the world. And I've here heard, I deal a lot with young pastors at Chautauqua, and some of them say, what were those years like? Almost like it was a long time ago. <laughs> Which it was. I think it was all brought home to me when my granddaughter, who was six years old, came home and told her mother she was studying Martin Luther King. And her mother said to her, well, you should go talk to your grandmother. She worked for him. <laughs> and, and she said, oh, no, he was in history. <laughs> and I realized in that moment that he was no more real to Jessica and her generation than George Washington is to me. And at that point in time, I thought every time I'm given an opportunity, I will try to relate the stories of those of us who were fortunate enough to work not only with Dr. King himself, but with the issues that, that he struggled with. The global encounter during all those tumultuous days will be with me for all of the years of my life. My ecumenical education began at Heights Christian Church in Cleveland, Ohio. When I tell you the pastor that changed my life, many of you know him. It was Albert Pennybacker, who was then the minister of Heights Christian Church in Cleveland, Ohio. He was not just a minister. He was an activist, but more than that, he was a Bible teacher. And I learned more from Al Pennyback than I learned in seminary, because he began to open my mind in a way that had never been opened before. My grandfather was a Presbyterian minister in the old United Presbyterian Church in North America, which is the old UP church, for those of you that know the difference between the now Presbyterians and that former UP church. And what I learned at the hands of that pastor was that the Christian faith is for all times and all places, every day, all day. But I also learned things that I had to unlearn. What I had to unlearn was a kind of certainty that that church and that church alone had the answers. It will surprise you, although some of you are old enough to remember this. In that church, we were not allowed to sing hymns. We were only allowed to sing songs put to music. That does feel like ancient history, doesn't it? And times have changed in that, in that matter of time. But I do credit Al Pennybacker and the Disciple Church, which has come to my home in every possible way for helping me to move beyond the certainties that kept me from being able to open my heart and my mind and my eyes to what was going on in the world. I credit Martin Luther King for setting me on a path that has been life-changing. I will never ever forget when he was working for the election of Carl Stokes, who became the first African-American mayor of a major American city. And I was working with Dr. King, and we were working with the churches, trying to get people to register to vote, trying because we knew if we got the vote out, Carl would get elected. 
And one time, my children, who always were with me when I was doing these things, and I think we were over on the west side of Cleveland. If you know Cleveland at all, it's very ethnically divided. One side of town, very black, one side, very ethnic. And people were calling us names and throwing things at us. And my daughter, who was then 10 years old, said, I cannot imagine why anybody would want to be mayor of a town when people treat you like this. I reminded her of that, and she called me one day on the phone and said, Mother, I'm going to run for mayor of Cleveland. <laughs> And I hope that you will be here to help me with my teenagers, <laughs> which in fact I did do, and with great pleasure. And she was the mayor of Cleveland, the first woman mayor, still the only woman mayor of a city like that. I also want to credit Philip Potter, who then was the secretary, the general secretary of the World Council of Churches. He taught me humility in the face of global diversity. There was always more to learn, suffering stories to be heard and absorbed, and life lessons taught by the struggles of the likes of Desmond Tutu, and by the women who all across the globe, whose gifts and graces were all too often buried in the face of age-old prejudices. At that point in time, hardly any women thought of being a minister. People kept saying to me, weren't you bitter that you couldn't be a minister when you were young? I said, no, I didn't even think about it, because there weren't any. I mean, I had no role models, nobody to look at, and no reason to particularly think about it. And I'll tell you, I'm grateful to have been ordained when I was 50 years old, because it makes me younger in my education. And when I look at pastors who are my age but graduated at 22 and 23, I was blessed with a time in history that was a very tough time, but the fact is I'm really closer in some ways to that generation than to the generation that is of my age. Now in my 14th year as pastor of the 137-year-old Chautauqua Institution, I have come to see that the scripture is still the most helpful tool that we have. And so if I were to have a scripture for this talk, though yes I know it's not a sermon, and yes I know, you know, our good friend who's only watching from above told me, remember Joan, it's not a sermon, it's a speech. <laughs> so uh, with him not here to exactly correct me, uh, I do have to think about the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And you'll see why. The fact of the matter is, we think of that as a wedding chapter often, or the love chapter. The fact of the matter is, there is wisdom beyond belief in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. It has a definitive handle on the life of faith. So perhaps the hallmark of the ecumenical life of faith. Remember it says in the 13th chapter, now I see through a glass darkly. Only then will I see face to face. And I think the gift of that scripture to our time is we have become in some ways a people too filled with certainty. Maybe the ecumenical gift of faith is the gift of ambiguity. Not a paralyzing ambiguity, not an ambiguity that doesn't allow people to have a passionate faith, but perhaps an ambiguity that calls us to humility and gratefulness for our own faith, and yet generous enough to try to understand and to reach out and to accept the faith of others. Think for just a minute of those you know who have been so very certain that their way and their way alone is God's way. It is God's way of seeing the life of faith. It in fact makes God narrow-minded. And it's hard to think of a God so large that we can't possibly understand this God. <clears throat> 
that this would be a narrow-minded person. Every day at the home missions in Chicago, we have breakfast for our guests. Now, you may think, well, oh, she went to the wrong page here. The fact of the matter is, it's a very instructive time. All of our guests that come, all the preachers, all the lecturers, you should pay to come and have breakfast. Not for the food, but for the conversation. The topics this year range all the way from the state of the world to the challenges of our children and grandchildren. Sitting at the table in the week I'm remembering was the preacher of our week and our lecturer, who was a Lincoln biographer, a Watergate survivor, and a Truman scholar. All of these remember what was happening last summer. We were about to go through a presidential election. How soon we forget what last summer was like. And so our Lincoln scholar said to me, I noticed that you're going to be preaching on Sunday. And he said, I thought I would give you just a little bit of advice. And so he said to me, let me share with you a thought from Abraham Lincoln. He said, we live in a time of too much certainty. And so I have to credit him with the opening of my mind and my eyes to that thought. We have become despairing of the depth of our polarization, the non-questioning certainty of candidates in our presidential election and the dysfunction of too many legislators. Wrestling with uncertainty appears to have no place in the world of faith. Convictions born of love and humankind, love for all of humankind, is rare. My own uneasy wrestling with the almost total lack of ambiguity in a very uncertain world, a failure to connect to a people facing an unpredictable future. I might say to you that I think we could make a case for ambiguity. Let me share with you the words that the Lincoln scholar gave to me as he left. He said, as you are preaching your sermon, I want you to think about Abraham Lincoln. And so I offer them to you today. Hear the words of Lincoln as he wrestled with the burden of being president during the Civil War. Know the tentative words, his uncertainty, his presidential searching. Here are his words. The will of God prevails. In great contests, each party claims to act in accordance with the will of God. Both may be, but one must be wrong. God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time. In the present civil war, it is quite possible that God's purpose is something different from the purpose of either party. And yet the human instrumentalities, meaning the Congress in his words, working just as they do, are the best adaption to affect God's purpose. I am almost ready to say that it is, listen to this careful word, I am almost ready to say, almost, that it is probably true, all words of tentativeness, that God willed this contest, and that he wills that it shall not end yet. By God's mere quiet power, God could have either saved or destroyed the Union without any human contest. And having begun, God could give the final victory to either side any day. And yet the war proceeds. We wonder why this piece of writing was found tucked away in a desk drawer never offered as a speech to a divided nation. Do we expect our leaders to always be certain, never questioning, 
never wrestling publicly with where the truth lies. Perhaps it is not polite to admit to struggling with the probables and possibilities of life as a public servant. Perhaps this is something that our pastors wrestle with as well. Do they dare, in front of a congregation, to express their uncertainty, their wrestling? Perhaps that is one of the ecumenical gifts that might be given to pastors. Leaders can often instruct, I think, by sharing their uncertainty, their wrestling with where they are known, where they see absolutes, their questioning, where does truth lie? I have an experience in my own life that illustrates this very point. When I was General Secretary of the National Council of Churches, the Orthodox churches, all nine of them, the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, the Armenian Orthodox, the Coptic Orthodox, and more. When I had been General Secretary for no more than three months, they decided that they were going to suspend their membership in the National Council of Churches. Now their decision had nothing to do with my being General Secretary, thank fortune for me. It was, however, based on the fact that the Episcopal Church had ordained a lesbian woman. Fast forward to our time today. This was 20 years ago. So I thought to myself, having been married to a lawyer, do we have any lawyers in the room? They used a very important word for lawyers. The Council of the Orthodox said they were suspending their membership. And I thought, we're going to latch on to that. Because suspending did not mean they were gone. It meant they had issues uncertainties, ambiguities that had to be dealt with. I was determined to get them back. But I had to face the fact that what I knew about the Orthodox churches was minimal. I remember learning a little bit of it in seminary, but not a lot, and even when I learned it, it didn't mean a lot to me. It wasn't particularly relevant to my life at that time, and so I decided that I would go to St. Lavender Seminary. Russian Orthodox Seminary in New York City, not as a student to be a full-time student, but to listen to what they had to say. The president of the seminary at that time was one Father Thomas Hopko, and he followed the teachings of the famous scholar Alexander Schmemann. And if you know the Russian Orthodox, these are the saints of that church. One day I was taking a course, and it happened to be focused on ministry. Father Hopko walked in, he happened to be the professor that day, and he saw me. The day came that the subject was ordination. Father Hopko did something I will never forget. He began his lecture by acknowledging my presence, and then said lovingly and carefully, Today, students, I will be teaching the Orthodox understanding of ordination. As you may be aware, the Orthodox have not ever, and do not at this point in time, ordain women. He continued with these words. As you know, we have in our class today a fellow Christian whose faith I honor. In her presence, and for your, and I'm going to do this, for your presence, and in prayerful recognition and reflection, I want to say, perhaps, I could be wrong. The ecumenical life of faith exhibited in Father Hopko's remarks. Things didn't change dramatically because he said that. It didn't change policy in the Orthodox Church. But his willingness to admit his own ambiguity his own questioning, his risk and willingness to speak his own doubts had the power to open hearts and minds. One wonders if such honesty would be possible in these days of blogging and tweeting and endless television commentary on everything that is said. We fear that admitting doubt and uncertainty might make us appear to be without conviction and courage. 
perhaps examining the lives of more courageous leaders would point the way. I have been privileged to know some of the era, this era's leaders and prophets. Desmond Tutu, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, Bayer's Monday. One of my other grandchildren, and they do keep me honest, said to me one day, Grandma, how did you know all these people? I said, Katie, I knew them when they were nobody. I knew them when nobody honored them. I remember when Nelson Mandela was on the list of terrorists. This country declared him to be a terrorist. And we too easily, I think, forget those days. I knew them before they became historic figures, during the period when their beliefs could cost them their very lives. And their supporters paid heavy dues for being their followers. I have learned much from their lives, and much, much more from their struggles than from their victories. One problem about history is, history gives you the victors. They tell you who wins and who loses. What is lost are the stories of the struggle. I always think this about Dr. King. We look at him now in a heroic way, and we forget the struggles, not only for him, but for the people that followed him. And it is in the struggles, in the sadness, and the sorrows of life, that we come face to face with just how uncertain life can be. The scripture offers us an understanding that we need not expect to have all the answers, for we know only in part. We see through a glass darkly. Understanding that we cannot know it all is an encounter with honesty that opens us to the truth of those whose way we neither know nor understand. Where is the center? The scripture tells us over and over that it is love that is our guidepost, not facts, not data, not the love you of casual conversations. It is the love that tests, that guides, that risks being wrong, that asks questions, that makes mistakes, love that costs, love that is sacrificial and painful. This, my friends, is the ecumenical life of faith. This is why Martin Luther King, most famous sermons, his guiding principle was the principle of, of love. His most famous book is called The Strength to Love, and it is the book of his sermons. He, of all people, knew the high cost of nonviolence and love in the face of deeply held and sometimes dangerous prejudices. This is why Nelson Mandela, after 28 years in prison, I shall never forget, and many of you I'm sure, remember the day that he walked out of prison. Tall, strong, regal, and someone said to him, Nelson, what are you going to do? How are you going to punish the people that took your life away from you? that took 28 years away from you and put you in prison. And I will never forget his answer. And it is an answer we all need to think about. He said, if I hate them, I will be their prisoner for the rest of my life. Only love can redeem the pain of the past. Only love and forgiveness can redeem the pain of the past. So he has lived his life as the lover of humankind. The struggle is not over in South Africa, but the people are free. Finally, a story of transformation, of certainty challenged. This is my favorite story. And the reason it is is because the man I'm going to tell you about, I'm going to ask to raise your hand, how many of you have heard of Bayer's Monday? Almost nobody. Bayer's Gaudé was the saint of the movement that brought Mandela to power. His name is not known in history, but he was a member of what was then called the Bruderbond, and the Bruderbond was the elite of South Africa. His family was the elite in the white of South Africa. He was scheduled to become the president of South Africa. He was the creme de la creme. 
South African society. He was a pastor. He was marked for leadership, possibly even the presidency of his country. He pastored the largest Dutch Reformed church in South Africa, a church that staunchly defended the system of apartheid, and he was a leading apologist for the system. But his certainty, his perfect life, made him very uneasy. He felt often like a blind man who refused to see the reality of those around him. And then one day, one of his servants, and if you remember South Africa, the black servants would never come into the dining room unless they were invited to come, bring the meal, and invited. And so one of his black servants burst into the dining room, which was completely what they were not supposed to do. But Bayers, the pastor deep in him, said to him, what is the problem? What are you doing in here? He said, Pastor, my wife is pregnant. She's about to deliver a baby. She's in deep, deep trouble, and she's dying. And he said, would you take me to her? Would you take me to her? Bayer's remember. that may lead to growth and understanding. So let us look for the strength to love, to risk and not to fear our missteps, to rethink, to live humbly with our God, to open always be to the possibilities that love will make a way, a path through our doubt and uncertainty. For now abides faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. My friends, of this 